Howdy, y'all! Gobble, gobble, gobble! <laughs> oh, welcome to another episode of the Bible in one year, the preacher's husband. Today we're talking about 1 Kings chapter 20 and 21. Tomorrow we're going to talk about 1 Kings chapter 22 and also 2 Chronicles 18. So, normally I don't say anything about what day it is because you can do the Bible in one year at any time. You can start it at any time. You can finish it at any time. You can do two or three videos a day. You can do one a day. You can skip around and make it last two years if you want. So, I try not to make a date specific, but today was Thanksgiving and I have a lot to be thankful for. So, I hope your day was as amazing as mine is, no matter what day you're watching this. So, we start out in chapter 20. And this chapter essentially chronicles the victory over Ben-Hadad. Now, this chapter clashes with the general pattern of Israelite strength under the dynasty of Omri. The general political strength and leadership culminated in Ahab's crucial participation in resisting the Assyrians at the Battle of Karkar since both the Great Drought and the Wars with Ben-Hadad occurred late in Ahab's rule, this chapter probably describes a brief weakness that is caused by the drought that we read about in chapter 17. Also, shed some light on Ahab's earlier desperate search for provisions for his chariot corps that we read about in chapter 18. Because all of this culminates and comes together into this, this war, so to speak. Now, what stood out a lot to me here was chapter 20, verse 11. This verse stood out to me big time. It says, The king of Israel answered, Say this, Don't let one who puts on his armor boast like the one who takes it off. What in the world does that mean? Well, the point of this saying is that a fighter shouldn't count his victories before the battle. So you don't want to be putting on your armor and talking about how, how you're about to win uh, before you're taking your armor off and you've already done it. So don't be boasting. Don't count your chickens before they hatched. <laughs> or your turkeys. Gobble, gobble. Go figure that one. Um, now, all through this chapter, God intervenes over and over. He helps um, intervene with the drunken panic that marked the defeat of the Aramean army. The purpose of the divine intervention was that Ahab would recognize God's character. But overall, in this chapter, that lesson failed. We see that over and over again. Verse 22, here we are again. God granted Ahab another gracious gift in warning him of Ben-Hadad's plan. Chapter, chapter 20, verse 22 says, The prophet approached the king of Israel and said to him, Go and strengthen yourself. Then consider carefully what you should do, for in the spring the king of Aram will attack you. Gave him a heads up here. All right, here we go again. Verse 28 of chapter 20. Here's another divine gift to Ahab, though it is for the sake of the Lord's name. So in verse 28 it says, Then the man of God approached and said to the king of Israel, This is what the Lord says, Because the Arameans have said the Lord is a god of the mountains and not a god of the valleys. I will hand over all this whole huge army to you. Then you will know that I am the Lord. So God has given Ahab gift after gift after gift as far as information about how to go about doing things. But over and over and over, he rebukes the Lord. In verses 31 to 34, he has a quick agreement that he makes... Um, with Ben-Hadad, and he was in his chariot, and it's clear that Ben-Hadad had relinquished claim here to some of Israelite cities and gave Ahab trading privileges in Aramean territory. From a human point of view, though, with the need to create an alliance with Damascus and anyone else who would join against the Assyrians, Ahab was politically wise and prudent. So it was kind of a good decision if you look at it from a politically correct standpoint. Um, it was very prudent in dealing gently with the defeated Aramaeans because that's going to attract other leaders possibly to join him in his, his um, endeavors. However prudent, however prudent that policy might have been, the prophetic voices speaking for God condemn this act of prudent mercy. So sometimes 
Being politically correct is not the right way to go because how many times in the Bible was God just politically correct? And uh, clearly he was not here. Um, and they condemn this act of prudent mercy. Once again, prudent politics conflicted with following the Lord. So being politically correct, the Bible says it right here, is not good. It's not in... in it's not it is in direct conflict with following what the lord says because many times god's going to ask you to do something that's not politically correct say something that's probably going to offend somebody because they have a different viewpoint than you but you know what that's what god calls us to do he doesn't call us to be politically correct he just calls us to do what he asked us to. As far as the prophets were concerned, Ben-Hadad had been set apart to the ban. In other words, he was banned, just like in Jericho. And Ahab had violate, uh, violated that divine band. Now, we get to chapter 21. This is Ahab here, and he is just drooling over this vineyard that's going on right there outside of his, his palace, his kingdom. He looks at it every day, and he wants this bad boy. Um, so he goes to, to Naboth, who owns this vineyard, and he's like, give me your vineyard. I'm going to give you a better vineyard somewhere else in this place if you prefer. Um, I'll even give you the, the value of it in silver if you'd prefer it that way. And Naboth is like, nope, not going to give it up. This is my inherited land. Well, in Israel, the law had legal provisions that protected the rights of Israelite landholding families. The land could not be permanently alienated from the family, but it had to be returned either by redemption or by the free return in the Jubilee year. We read about that in Leviticus chapter 20. There were no provisions for the selling or the exchange of land such as that which Ahab requested of Naboth. Therefore, as when they were discussing this, Naboth declined and he said no i'm not going to sell my father's inheritance to the king so he decides he's not going to do this so king zeal's a hornet about this he's just he's mad he goes back home and guess what he tells his wife have you ever gone home and whined to your wife i can't believe what happened to work today can you believe this well she goes off and she goes and writes some letters so she said listen Here's what you're going to do. You're going to exercise your world power. You get up. You get you some food. You be happy. And I'm going to get you that vineyard. You just watch. So she writes some letters. Jezebel goes to work writing them letters. And then, of course, this is a scheme that involves perverting the law. It involves perjury because she's signing his name to stuff. It also ends in murder for the, for the king to be able to get this land but eventually he does she gets this land for him but then the lord's judgment comes down on ahab for it the word of the lord came through elijah with it now it says here in verse 25 of chapter 21 still there was no one like ahab who devoted himself to do what was evil in the lord's sight and why well here's why because his wife jezebel incited him his wife Jezebel incited him. Because after all, what does a Jezebel want? A Jezebel, who is named after Jezebel, wants a few things. She wants control over her husband. Then she wants control over everything that he does and everything he's involved with. His religion, his work, which in this case, he was the king. So she wants control over him and everything that he does. She wants control over his religion. She wants to encourage him to be religious in a way that she wants him to be as opposed to the way that God wants him to be. A Jezebel wants to basically be the one in charge, the one in control, the boss of everything. And it's not in a positive leadership way. It is in a controlling self-centeredness way. So this is why Ahab did what he did so many times over and over because he was led in the wrong direction by Jezebel.
Now, there was a moment where he somewhat repented in the, at the end of this chapter, but it was a pretty weak repentance as far as I'm concerned. And nowhere did the Bible actually say repentance. It just says he tore his clothes and he basically did, a, did the ritual things that would mean that you would be repenting and, or, and humbling yourself. And, of course, in the next chapter, we'll find out that he did humble himself, kind of, so the Lord continued to work on Ahab. I hope to, this has touched you. If it has, click the like button and subscribe button. And click the little jingle bell so you get notified the next time I upload a video. Which will be tomorrow for another episode of the Bible in one year with the preacher's husband. We'll see you then.